Well, thank you all for coming again uh, for the last of our presentations in this year's Student Scholar Series, this time by third year student Melissa Mulray Suarez. Excuse me, second year. She's got one left. Uh, before I introduce Melissa, let me thank Professor Roger Hartley for agreeing to be her respondent today. As you know, Professor Hartley is the past secretary of the Labor and Employment Law Section of the American Bar Association, a member of the Order of the COEF, the uh, American Law Institute, the Labor and Employment Law Section of the ABA, and the Industrial Relations Research Association. His book, Labor Relations Law in the Private Sector, currently is in its second edition, has been published in both hardback and paperback versions. In addition, Professor Hartley has published numerous articles primarily in the areas of labor law, constitutional law, and federal courts, and has lectured widely in these and other subject areas. He is the director of the John Fanning Center for Labor Studies and the coordinator of the Plato PAPS Fellowship Program, which provides law students with work and educational experiences in the area of workers' rights. I'd like to thank Professor Hartley for being with us today. Now let me introduce today's student scholar, Melissa Moray Suarez. Melissa is a graduate of Boston University, where she majored in history with a focus in history of conflict. Prior to law school, Melissa worked for five years in human resources, first in Boston and then as a recruiter in an international nonprofit organization here in Washington. In law school, Melissa found her experiences in HR led to a keen interest in labor and employment law. Melissa pursuing the concentration in labor and employment uh, as a result. Her interest in labor and employment led to an internship at the U.S. Office of Personnel Management, where she is currently working in its Office of General Counsel, and she hopes to put her skills to use this summer as a summer associate at Aiken Gump. <coughs> Melissa is a member of the Catholic University Law Review, who nominated her work for the series, and will continue with the Law Review next year as a lead articles editor. Last year, Melissa read an article in the newspaper about Vergara versus California, the case that is the subject of her talk, and she was immediately intrigued by the conflicting rights at play. Melissa's sister is a teacher, and she has a long family history of labor union members and supporters, so further research about Vergara had significant personal meaning for her. I'll now turn the floor over to the last presenter in this year's Student Scholar Series, Melissa Moray Suarez, and the title of her presentation, as you see, The Shift from the Constitutional Right to Equality in Education to Quality Education in California through Vergara versus California. Melissa. Thank you, Professor Harmon, uh, and I'd like to just take a moment to thank Professor Hartley again for agreeing to be my respondent. He was also my expert reader, so if he wasn't sick of this topic before now, he certainly will be after today. Um, I'd also just like to briefly thank my husband, Brian Suarez, who was integral throughout this writing process. He did a lot of uh, editing for me and kept me fed and, and sane throughout the, the year. Uh, I'd like to thank my sister, Elizabeth Mulry, who is the teacher uh, that was referred to and who also did some significant editing for me, and my friend Ginny Dominguez, who also did quite a bit of editing. So before we jump into Vergara v. California, it's important to have a little bit of background on uh, California and the state of education in California. So as a state, California purports to have a long-standing commitment to education. Um, they exhibit this through specific language in their constitution that deals with education. Article 9, Section 1 is entitled Encouragement of Education. And in that section, uh, California says that a general diffusion of knowledge and intelligence is essential to the preservation of rights and liberties of the people. So California thought it very important that educated people would know their rights and know how to defend them. Uh, and this was put into the California Constitution in 1879. Article 9, Section 5 places the direct responsibility of maintaining and providing the, pu the public school system on the legislature of California. Again, it was in 1879 that this was put into their, uh, their constitution, and that pretty clearly outlines who the state thought would be responsible for implementing this, uh, the education program there. Now, not to be outdone, teachers in California have also had a longstanding commitment to education and to supporting one another through professional development, through encouragement of new tactics, new procedures, um, and that's evidenced in some of the labor unions, the teacher um, labor unions that are, are in California. The California Teachers Association, for example, has been active in the state since 1863. That's only 13 years after California even became a state. <coughs> 
uh, the California Federation of Teachers, they were latecomers, uh, and they were only founded in 1919. Uh, but both teachers unions put uh, on their website as part of their mission a strong commitment to supporting students' education and learning experiences. So it's not simply a place for teachers to come and complain, it's also to put forth a, a strong front for education. However, in 2012, when the suit originated, California ranked 46th in the nation in fourth grade reading levels and 47th in the nation in eighth grade math levels. That does not really evidence a strong commitment to education, and that's exactly what the plaintiffs in the Vergara suit felt. So in 2012, a group of students in the California public school systems through Guardians Ad Litem brought a lawsuit against the state uh, in which the teachers uh, unions eventually became interveners. This lawsuit specifically challenged a group of statutes in the California Education Code and alleged that these statutes allowed grossly ineffective teachers to keep their jobs. Now, the challenge statutes included a, a so-called LIFO statute, that's a last in, first out statute, and that deals with when there are going to be large scale layoffs in a district. Um, it also had a statute involving teacher tenure that was problematic according to the plaintiffs, and a small group of statutes that dealt with uh, dismissal procedures for teachers who were found to be deficient. And the plaintiffs alleged specifically that the challenge statutes allowed these more grossly ineffective teachers to keep their jobs in districts that were comprised mainly of minority and low income students. And they said that this was a violation of the Equal Protection Clause of the California Constitution. And they stated that this was because the quality of education was adversely impacted and that was denying these students equal access to education in California by having these significant disparities in, in uh, education quality. So what were some of the problems specifically with these statutes? Well, one of the things that was alleged were that the tenure statute effectively gave lifetime teaching status to teachers after only two years of teaching. Uh, the procedures were in place to evaluate teachers after about a year to a year and a half of teaching, but by the second year of their teaching, they were granted uh, a so-called lifetime tenure uh, within the school district. And that was seen as just much too short uh, for effectively assessing a teacher's ability. The dismissal procedures, they said, were too cumbersome and too expensive. It deterred school districts from even beginning any sort of removal procedure, procedure for any grossly ineffective teacher. Um, and because they were so discouraged by this, some districts just allowed these grossly ineffective teachers to continue teaching for years at a time. And then the last in, first out, LIFO statute, uh, they were concerned about that because it didn't take into consideration any relative competencies of teachers. It was a, a competency blind statute and simply dealt with when you were hired into the district. If you were the last one in, you are going to be the first one out in any sort of large scale layoff. So the court actually decided for the plaintiffs in this case, and this is at, simply at the court level right now. It's in its very nascent stages. Um, the, the court said that these statutes were unconstitutional according to the California Constitution, and it issued a permanent injunction against these, this group of challenge statutes. Um, but that injunction has been stayed pending appellate review, which is why I think some of the, thing, some of the issues that I've spotted are, are quite important. Um, to put into context this ruling, This, this can't, the ruling in, in Vergara is possibly sustainable under the California Constitution, but it is likely not sustainable under the United States Constitution. The Supreme Court heard a case, uh, San Antonio Independent School District v. Rodriguez, and there the court held that wealth-based discrimination in a school situation uh, such as this does not rise to the level of inquiry which requires strict scrutiny, which was used in uh, the court's assessment of the Vergara case. Now, the Supreme Court acknowledged that education is of grave significance to society, but did not recognize it as a fundamental right uh, in the same way that something like a subsistence or um, housing assistance would be. So even though education was vitally important, according to the Supreme Court, it wasn't important enough to guarantee that there was an absolute equality guaranteed by the Constitution. So not sustainable maybe at the, at the federal level. But 
At the California level, there are prior cases that have inched closer and closer to coming out with an outright state statement saying that quality education is guaranteed. There was a couplet of cases in the 1970s called Serrano 1 and Serrano 2, and those cases effectively invalidated the California school financing system that was in place at the time. They held in California, education is a fundamental interest under the Constitution and is thus protected or is thus afforded equal protection um, under that Constitution. And then in Butt v. California, which came a couple years later, the court looked at whether access to the buildings and a full school year was considered uh, <laughs> something that would be protected by the Equal Protection Clause. And they found that, yes, again, because in Serrano 1 and Serrano 2, the holding was that in California, education is a fundamental interest. Access to the school year, to the buildings, to having a full school year was also something that would be protected by the equal protection rights in the California Constitution. Now these previous three cases are primarily about funding or access to funding in order to continue having the school year. So Vergara takes a little step past that funding and looks more into the realm of personnel issues. So Vergara is saying essentially that funding is essential in, uh, in schools in California. There's a right to equal access to education and that is, fund that is funded by the state, but also the quality of education is part of that component and you're going to look at the personnel, the quality of the personnel, in order to find that quality. So there's no denying that students should be afforded the right to a high quality education, but there are a couple of issues that are presented here in Vergara that I think are, are well worth pointing out. So if we are going to find this uh, right to quality education, the question becomes, did the court reach the correct decision and in joining these statutes that have the effect of keeping the, in place poorly performing teachers. And I would submit that these two salient problems uh, pop out of this case. So to the extent that the challenge is about the difficulty of removing poorly performing teachers, that should be something that is held, that the school districts themselves are held responsible for to enforce the statutes that are in place. The California legislature clearly thought that there needed to be statutes or, or um, prescriptions for how removal processes are to, are to uh, be affected when teachers are involved, outlined it in the statutes, and it's up to the school districts to be implementing these. There's an obligation for management to make sure that they're implementing their policies regularly, and if it needs to be assessed, then they're is a way to do that through either writing regulations or through discussing with the state legislature. Um, and uh, essentially, this remedy that was asked for, too, is punishing the effective teachers. The stati statistics presented in the case were that about one to three percent of teachers in California were estimated to be grossly ineffective, which means 97 to 99 percent of teachers are not grossly ineffective. Yet their rights, their removal procedures, their tenure opportunities are being removed if these statutes are, do in fact go, go forth with this um, injunction. There's also a competing uh, federal constitutional procedural due proce process issue at play. If these statutes are permanently enjoined, what will the process be for removal, removals now? So we know that at the federal level, procedural due process guarantees notice and then a right to be heard in a meaningful time and in a meaningful way. The way that the dismissal statutes are currently written, the teacher receives written notice and then has the opportunity to either respond in writing or to request an oral hearing. There is a limited period of discovery, which in some senses would make sense because if there's an accusation that a teacher is performing poorly, it's not something that happens overnight. It's not uh, you come in on Monday, you're doing well, you come in on Thursday, you've been performing poorly in the last two days. So having the opportunity to amass some sort of proof or, or defense, I think is quite important for teachers. They have a hearing, and then there are only three options once that hearing occurs. The teacher is either dismissed, the teacher is not dismissed, which is good for the teacher, or the teacher is suspended for a specific period of time without pay. And that can be anywhere from mm -hmm 
a week to a school year. Uh, <coughs> but those are the only three options. There's no remedial in between probationary period for the, for the teachers. So the second problem is if we do have this right to quality education and we're going to enjoin these statutes because they don't allow for this equal access to quality education, what does that quality education look like? The court never addressed it. The plaintiffs didn't address it. And to me it seems a little bit odd to put forth this idea that there's a quality education guarantee without having any sort of framework or outline of what that quality education will be. So the, who's going to get to define this? Will it be at the district levels? And in that case, what kind of oversight occurs? And for that matter, does quality education look the same throughout California, or is it different in Oakland than it is in San Diego? Is it different in a rural area than it is in a city? So it becomes very important to have some sort of definition or some sort of guidelines mm -hmm. for quality. And at the state level, once this is defined, how is it going to be measured? Is this solely through looking at the teachers? And if that is the case, are we looking at the teachers on a year-to-year -year basis, from the beginning of the year to the end of the year? Is it based on teacher, um, on what kind of credentials teachers have? And then that calls into mind some sort of problem with buying your credentials. If you have teachers who can afford it, both financially and time and, and in their personal lives to get a PhD and that all of a sudden makes them a qualified teacher under this definition or in giving quality education, will there be a problem or a rise in these for-profit universities that are now going to specialize in teacher credentialing? I think that would be something that a smart businessman might see in California, some sort of opportunity. Are we going to measure this, uh, this quality through more testing of students? Education um, advocates are already up in arms about all the levels of testing that happen at the state level, the federal comparators. Some kids just don't test well as well. So are we waiting just to have one test per year? Is it multiple tests per year on top of the other state mandated tests? You know, there, are, there are a lot of issues with the testing. Is it going to be through administrators regularly reviewing the classrooms? And then are we willing to put that burden on the administration of school districts to be in classrooms on a daily, weekly, monthly basis reviewing every single teacher in the district? I think you're beginning to see all the problems that, that could arise from this, um, from this ruling. So we, we know that children should be afforded an education, equal access to an education, and I don't disagree that children should have high quality education, but there's a real cost that is at play here. And nowhere in any sort of court papers did the plaintiffs address this, nowhere did the court address this, and it doesn't seem like the uh, education advocates who supported this lawsuit have addressed this either, talking about where any of this funding would come from in order to guarantee this absolute quality of education to all California students, nor has anyone put forth any sort of suggestion about the parameters of what this quality education is going to be. So I would say, fairly, the goal of everybody involved in this is quality education for students. I think it's an unfair fight to be pitting teachers against students because they're all there for the same reason. Everybody wants the children to learn. It's just they're having disagreements about how we're going to get this quality education to the students. So we have some concerns about the actual cost of this. Um, I would also submit that this could have a chilling effect on attracting high quality educators. If you already have a, a career path in the primary and secondary education that does not pay very well in some areas, that creates the need for a lot of out-of-class work time in preparing lessons and um, you know, developing your pedagogy, what is going to incentivize high-level, high-quality teachers to continue teaching if there are no sort of protections in their jobs or no sort of due process that's going on or, or significant due process going on if their job is at stake? Um, and as I mentioned before, I could certainly see the rise in the purchasing of credentials for, for education if that's how this is going to be measured. Um, but my real and, and biggest problem, I think, with the uh, Vergara decision was the lack of balance that the court uh, had in its decision. 
there was no mention of these competing interests or these competing problems. Um, and there was a lack of acknowledgement even that there were any sort of competing interests at play. And to me, that's, that's an unfair and, and unwarranted way to look at this problem. Um, I would also suggest that if this decision does stand, if, it, if it's found to be uh, a good decision, that it, it's a hydra of a decision. So you've eliminated the head of one problem, but you'll have all these other heads of problems popping up uh, from here on, and, and this is certainly not the end of litigation about education in California. And I would suggest that the next uh, lawsuit will be from teachers who have an issue with the, uh, with the decision. Um, thank you. Thank you, Melissa, and Professor uh, Hartley, for your productive response. Um, in competitive diving, which I've never been a competitive diver, they, they have this idea. I was a backstroker, that called degree of difficulty, that what they do is they, they take the score that the diver gets and they multiply it by the degree of difficulty on the idea that the more difficult divers are going to be more lowly graded. So when Melissa came in to see me about this article, you know, it took only about 10 minutes for me to realize that on a 10-point scale, I mean, this was an 8-9, maybe a 9-2, and uh, I tried to warn her off the subject, and she would not be warned off to her, to her credit. And uh, she just did a commendable job. I mean, if you've had a chance to read this document, it's just outstanding piece of work. So that's the first thing I think I'd like to say. Second thing, um, I don't know if Brian knows this, uh, Melissa's husband, but Melissa has intentions of continuing to work on this article. Uh, in, the, in the hope that it would be published uh, outside the school in a professional journal. And uh, if, I don't know if Brian knew this, but now, now you do, Brian, so you're <laughs> going to have another year of this. So in that spirit of thinking of this kind of as, a, as an interim draft, I, I, I had three ideas that I would just share with Melissa for whatever value she may find in, in, the, in the next draft of all this. Number one, uh, you know, public employee union bashing has become kind of a national pastime. Uh, and this Vigera case, I think, is part of it. But it seems to me the reality is that public employee unions are not going to survive. They're not going to be sustainable unless they earn public respect. Do you agree with that? Well. So, some of these California statutes were plain silly. Uh, I mean, if you work for three years in California school, you got tenure, three years, but they had to let you know in March of your second year if you were going to be hired for the third year. You realize what that means? Basically, the tenure decision was made in the middle of the second year of teaching. And and uh, California's own experts said that that's a silly system that took at least three to five years. This is, this is the experts that were defending the statute said it would take three to five years to be able to uh, decide whether or not a teacher is qualified. So on the one point of view, one could argue that the judge here has done the public employee movement in California a favor. by pushing the legislature to rethink the tenure statute. And I don't know why it takes two to 10 years and $50,000 to fire somebody. I'm not even sure if that's really true, but that's what uh, the court found. And if that's true, that's not sustainable. That's not sustainable. It'll, it'll, next thing you know, it'll be like Wisconsin. You know, and people will say, no, we're not gonna have these public employee unions. So, on the, on the one hand, my first point is maybe indirectly the judge did the public employee unions a favor by pointing out some silliness in the personal system. Point two, I think you can quibble 
with the judge's analytics. Whatever this case is, it's not an equal protection case. On the face of it, it's facially neutral, right? There was no finding that it was the poor, tell me if this is wrong, it was the poor jurisdictions that ended up with a disproportionate number of the unqualified teachers. Was there a finding that it was the? There was an anecdotal finding from a, a LA Times article, but nothing, uh, no official. Anecdotal finding from the LA Times article. <laughs> that ain't equal protection, right? But th it, this becomes really important for the third point I'm gonna make. Whatever this case is, it's not an equal protection case, no matter what you call it. This is a substantive due process case. This is a case where the judge finds under California law that there's a substantive right to a quality education across the board. But Serrano 1 and 2 and Butts, Buck, Butt, Just Butt, whatever, that <laughs> B case, were all equal protection cases. And all of them simply were wealth cases saying you can't let the poor jurisdictions uh, you know, have less quality education than more wealthy jurisdictions. So it seems to me that somebody has to take that judge to task on his analytics. And, that, and uh, I think M Melissa did a lot, a good job of that. And you could even, you could even beef that up a little bit and really put it to the judge and, and say, you know, Serrano does not support the concept that there's a uh, quality, a uh, substantive right to quality education. And, and even if it does, then it's, it's a substantive due process case, not an equal protection case. Why quibble? I'm gonna quibble with what the judge calls it for the third and hopefully more important observation. Strict scrutiny is designed for what we call a first generation constitutions. First generation constitutions are thou shalt not constitutions, you know, that, Thou shalt, shalt not interfere with citizens' autonomy to interstate travel, to marry, to uh, pray as you care to. You know, the first generation constitutions is what our constitution is. They're, they don't promise you anything other than the government won't interfere with your autonomy. And for those kind of constitutions, we need a system to figure out when should the government, should the courts get involved in second guessing the legislature and when should they not? Strict scrutiny has developed as the mechanism for sorting that question out, okay? When you say, however, that there's a right to a quality education, now what the judge has done is converted the, con the California Constitution into a second, what's called a second generation constitution. A second generation constitution is one that guarantees the people things from the government. Housing, a, a proper job, a, a minimum amount to eat, quality education. South America has second generation constitutions. Europe has second generation constitutions. Rodriguez says we don't have one in the United States Constitution. This case says uh, the uh, the Vigera case says that California has a uh, second generation constitution. That is striking. But then he uses first generation constitution methodology to measure whether the legislature has violated. Think about it. You can't use the concept of compelling state interest as the way of measuring whether or not the California legislature has fulfilled its obligation to provide a quality uh, education because it's all in the eye of the beholder. It, it's up to the judge because there are always less drastic alternatives because it's usually money, right? So you shift money from the highway fund to the, uh, to the school fund. There's always a less drastic alternative and so my, my last observation, Melissa, and I'd like to hear your thoughts on any of this, is conservatives who might applaud 
the public employee union bashing in this case, and I'm sure a lot of champagne was, was drunk the night this case came down, conservatives should not be happy about this case. Because this case is a full employment act for California judges. <laughs> Thank you. It's a good joke. I was hoping it would work. Seriously. This, this case, if this gets legs, if this becomes law in California, then judges will have an enormously enhanced role. Melissa's point, what is quality education? And then my point is when is there a compelling state interest not for the legislature not to throw more quality, more dollars? Who's going to decide that? It's going to be judges. Thoughts? Uh, so I would agree that it is largely a, um, an employment-related case. It's not so much a, a, about the, um, the education in, in the sense that it's about this, the way that the teachers are, are afforded their jobs. Um, I think one of the problems that also arises is that it's the type of problem you can't throw money at but it's being treated like the type of problem you can throw money at. So your suggestion that there, you can always have less drastic measures and you can shift money from here to there, that, that didn't work mm -hmm. in California. I mean, that's why mm -hmm. Serrano, Serrano 1 and Serrano 2 and, and but all involved shifting this money around, trying to make sure that there was a more equal dispersion of funding for education. And if that had worked, I don't think we would have this case here. So I think simply throwing money at this problem is not going to be an answer, which gets into your final point of the quality. So then who does get to decide in that? You know, if, if judges are deciding, then they're one court case, one decision of a judge in California maybe will give some sort of guidelines, but then there, there's going to be pushback. And I think as education evolves, as pedagogical tools evolve as different things become available for students in, in learning opportunities, the idea of quality is going to shift too. And then do we have to litigate over it again? Or can we legislate? Um, so I certainly think there are problems there. And then I, your point about first generation and second generation constitutions was not something that I had uh, really considered. Full disclosure, I had not fully had constitutional law yet. <laughs> um, I was midway through constitutional law at the time of writing this, so that was not something that, that popped into my head, but I think that's an excellent point, and I think that's certainly worth, um, worth exploring because it does seem that it's not as much an equal protection problem as it is a substantive due process problem, and so it's trying to fit a square peg in a round hole, um, which is problematic. I mean, it was just inherent that I understood that it was problematic for that reason, but uh, it, it certainly was problematic. Um, so those are, those are excellent points and, and things that you thought you were going to get rid of me, but unfortunately I don't think you are now because we'll have to discuss these further. Um, but yes, I, I think those are all excellent points and, and I am looking forward to looking into them more. So Should we throw it open to the Thank crowd you. and see what they think? Yes, Professor Jennison. Um, so when you were doing your research for this paper, did you find uh, other litigation that was similar to this? Because my recollection is, for example, in Montgomery County, Maryland, the tenure system is the same. You know, Montgomery County is always uh, questioning the whole, do we throw more money at it? Um, or how do we fix the educational problem? And of course, we have a huge problem there with the have schools and the have not schools, just like I'm sharing at Pepper in California. So have you seen any kind of um, wage litigation or other cases that you saw when you were so Vergara was really the first of its kind to challenge in this way. And since uh, the decision in Vergara, there have been several other lawsuits that have been filed. So two specifically in uh, New York State. I believe both are in New York City, but in different districts in New York City. Um, they, they have both actively filed lawsuits. There is talk about a lawsuit in uh, Wisconsin, of all places, um, about also similar tenure statutes. Uh, I believe Tennessee is also uh, looking into it, and I think there was one more uh, state. It may have been Georgia. Uh, so, so it's certainly, the decision bolstered a lot of attention for education reformers, and I think um, 
it's been seen as a, as a new tool or a new strategy movement to put forth some of their, um, I don't want to say demands, but, but some of the, the ideas that they have uh, about reforming education and, and raising the levels of quality of education. So prior to this, there wasn't really, there weren't um, similar suits in this vein, but there were suits about uh, financing in different places. So California addressed them, other states have addressed it as well. Some states come out saying you have to do, uh, you have to do equal financing for your, for your uh, school districts. Other states are not as, as persuaded by that. Yes. So I enjoyed your talk. I missed the first few minutes, so I apologize if, I, um, if you covered this, and it's actually related to Professor Jefferson's point. So there was a case in California, um, and I only know about it, even though this is outside of my area because I worked on it. It was the first case I worked on when I came out of law school, and it was a uh, class action. Um, Williams was the name of the case. I don't know if you've run across this, but you should, if you're going to keep working on this paper, look at it because it was a class action of uh, students, um, K through 12, uh, public school students in California, who sued the state of California um, for um, violating their constitutional rights. It was basically the same claim. The focus was uh, not exclusively on uh, the tenure statute, you know, the tenure laws, although I think that was one of the issues. It was, you know, a holistic attack on California's public school system. So, um, you know, Kids are freezing because the heat doesn't work. Um, uh, there are rats running around the buildings. Uh, it was, and, and I believe the case, and this is testing my memory, but I believe it was modeled on a Texas case. And basically the, the request was that the state take over public education. That was what the plaintiffs wanted. Um, the case settled ultimately, I think, but um, but it was litigated for a while because after I left my law firm, my colleagues had to depose kindergartners. Um, <laughs> so that got a lot of, I, I'm not exaggerating, literally, so that got a lot of press. And um, ultimately, Governor Davis, our firm represented the state of California, Governor Davis uh, settled the lawsuit. But I would think for defining quality, you know, that, that case might, um, help you um, or, or help think about some of these issues um, because one thing about California that I remember came up a lot was all the languages that are spoken in California for instance which makes California in some ways you know the challenges for public educators different than in, in some other states. Mm -hmm. And I would imagine that would make it difficult for the state to take over wholesale the, yeah. the education system because if you've got certain areas that you know, Spanish is the primary language spoken at home and then you have to have educators that can speak Spanish, it's a little bit harder, I would think, to figure out that equality scale or the right. quality or, scale. In some districts there are 40 different languages that are spoken, mm -hmm. right? So, and I mean a lot of people thought this case was crazy because they thought who would want the state of California to take over public, public education um, even though it had you know, at least allegedly worked in Texas. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes. You mentioned briefly at the beginning that uh, only 3% of teachers were deemed to be ineffective. Um, I was wondering whether the plaintiffs in this case were able to make a, an, an empirical sort of linkage or causal relationship between those 3% and tenure. You're wondering if they did that already or if they could do that? If they did that. I don't think they did that. So a, a lot of, much of their um, expert testimony was speculative, I would say, uh, because it was an estimate that it was one to three percent of teachers were grossly ineffective. Uh, and there wasn't a, a huge discussion, um, at least in the briefs, about how they came up with those numbers. Uh, maybe, you know, trying to get into depositions or something would be uh, more helpful. but. Um, I think that would strengthen their case, certainly, if they could link up the, the ineffective teachers and then specifically with certain school districts. And I think that would make their case much stronger, saying that would, would these, these, these right, 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 that the these, the mm -hmm, that they're concentrated in these specific areas where it is only minority students, or vastly minority students, or vastly uh, low-income students. So I think that would be very helpful, but for the most part, it, it was, either anecdotal or, or a little too speculative, I think, to 
be so strong to, to get the result that came out of it. Any other? Well, well, thank you, Melissa, um, for her excellent presentation. I think it's, it's professional ones we, we've had done. It's fantastic. Thank and you. on behalf of the faculty, we give you a small plaque uh, to commemorate this day. And thank you, Professor Hartley. <laughs> and thank you all for coming. Uh, and we'll um, begin our eighth year of the series next year. So thank you very much. Thank you.